محمد رسول الله محمد رسول الله
are partners in sin. So this is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa was trying to give the same lesson. That first they committed the sin, that they listened to falsehood. Then they committed the second sin, that they consumed unlawful profit. Right? Same thing, that why don't the rabbis and priests prevent them? Why do they listen passively to it and not do anything about it? Okay. So let's stick with this example to illustrate the whole concept. So what is a person supposed to do then if somebody backfires in front of me? So I'm sitting with X, and X does a leave us of Y in front of me. And I listen to it in the sense that I hear it. I wasn't sitting with him for the sake of listening to this, but obviously he said it in a conversation with three, four people, and I was sitting there at that table, so I heard it. But if I'm just silent, that's going to be a problem for me. So now there are different levels in which you have to speak, and it depends on the situation, right? The highest level is called Nahi Anal Mulka. Nahi Anal Mulka. Which means that you would tell that person that, look, you know, what you just did right now was backbiting. You may realize it or you may not realize it, but it's my duty as your fellow believer to make you realize that. Now, you may not always be able to do this in every situation, right? It may be your mother-in-law who is saying something about the other daughter-in-law, and if you try to do nahiyan al munkar with the mother-in-law, then the girls can tell you what happens in that case. <laughs> huh? <laughs> okay, so maybe you can't always use the direct approach, but you have to then use an indirect approach. You still can't be silent. You still can't be silent. So another way is then to say something good about that person. So for example, if somebody says, oh, you know, X, you know, X, you need to get angry all the time, unfairly. So you heard it, you were sitting there. So say, you know that X also gives a lot of charity. Right? So you mentioned something good about that person. And then the way you give the hidayah or doubt to the person that did the backbiting, is, you know, X, what X also gives a lot of charity. And you know, let's be honest, all of us have some good qualities and some bad qualities. So the person who is even average intelligence will realize that I'm getting a guidance here, and a siha here, an advice here, a signal here, that you know, this isn't something appropriate to say. Because we all have good qualities and all have bad qualities, and if we all start exposing the bad qualities of one another, then there will be nobody who will be unexposed left in the world. So some, uh, these are just ways, I'm saying, you can come up with other ways also, but with wisdom, with temperance, but you do have to say something. If you can't say something for some reason, then there is one last thing you can do, which is called e'raz an al-majlis. You have to leave that gathering. You simply excuse yourself politely. You don't have to make a hus, and if you don't have to stand up and say, oh, well, if you can say, oh, then better than you sit down and say something with wisdom. <laughs> there is no need to express your frustration and exasperation. That's not why. <laughs> right? Then you can get up and excuse yourself. That is also an expression. And any person of average intelligence will also realize, right, that you know, all of a sudden they got up and even if they quietly, politely didn't say anything, but they left. So maybe something happened that was inappropriate, which caused them to make that decision to leave. Now our problem is that many of us are too shy. So sometimes it's very good to be shy, but this type of shyness Shyness to do Amr bil ma'roof and nahi al mulka is not a good thing. And other people have another problem that they're too bold. Sab kutok na chate. Rog tok. Love it. They're just waiting for somebody to just give us so that they can do their nahi al mulka. They're ready. They have the ammunition. The gun is fully loaded. And they're just waiting. <laughs> somebody does some mulka. Right? And I can drop my hadith, I can say to them, huh? This is another extreme. This is sometimes harsh temperament. This is also not good. This isn't the way to follow something. You see, when you follow sunnah, you have to follow what he did and how he did it. It's not enough to just follow what he did. So when you look at hadith and say the way he did it, it was with wisdom. 
It was with excellence. It was with temperance. Right? And that's why it had a good effect. And the one who just wants to rope talk, which in English means they just want to, you know, point out the person's problem, it's not successful. You actually won't be successful. You'll walk away patting yourself on the back. I did a really super tough night on But it, you didn't succeed. <laughs> you didn't succeed. It didn't change. It's not going to change the person's behavior. In fact, the only thing will happen once you walk away is they'll start doing your human. <laughs> They're going to start talking about, about you. You just increased their human. That's all you've done. Right? But the point is, right, and here, to be fair, because what Satan was some man by the backbiter and his listener, meant the person who is backbiting and the person who is happily listening, the person who is lending his ear, right? And so that's why I said you have to get up and walk away. So the person should know. Okay, this is not a person who's interested in my gossip. As opposed to sometimes people, the first thing they say when we meet them, what's the scoop? What's the latest? So they know that this is a person who's a very active listener. Avid listener is my fan. <laughs> they love to hear the gossip that I have to share. So that's what this means. That type of listener. It doesn't mean the person who just hears it. But still, even if you just hear it, you should show some way. And Sayyidina Sosam did also say, in the very famous hadith of Nahil Mulka, that stop it with your hand. By the way, hand does not mean violent force. Stop it by your hand means build fail. Stop it by action. Take some corrective action. Right? If you cannot take corrective action, then use some corrective speech. And if you can't do that, Sayyidina Sosam clearly is acknowledging that there are some cases where that's not possible. Then the Prophet himself said that we can do the first two, then at least feel dislike for it in your heart. Right? And so again, the person who is always, he will insist to you that, brother, you must do nothing in one car. He'll make, he's actually doing tahrif of sunnah. <laughs> he's deleting that third part of the hadith where Sayyidina Rasulullah himself acknowledged that there will be cases where you cannot stop it by action and you cannot censor it with speech. So you have to censor it, means find it blameworthy in your heart. So the Sunnah has clearly made that level also. So you have to see, depending on the case, depending on the person, depending on the situation, but at some level you have to be there. If only that you find it blameworthy in your heart. Right? So this was a more detailed explanation specifically about backbiting, but the point here was again about the fasting of the Salihin and that what Imam al meant that listening to it is like saying it, was that because in the Hadith the Prophet said that if you say these things it breaks your fast, so Imam al was wants to suggest is that even if you listen to it, it's danger that you've broken your fast. Not the ordinary fast, but the fast of the Salihin, it will not be like the fast of the Salihin if you actively lend your ear to riba or you listen to other unlawful things. So it means to watch what we see, to watch what we say, and to watch what we hear. Then in the next one, do not, and here, it means everything else, means all other organs. Alright, so don't use your eyes, your tongue, your ears, and number four, and any and all other organs, limbs and organs, to disobey Allah's Prophet. Anyway, so the bottom of 77, keeping all other limbs and organs away from sin, keeping the hands and feet away from reprehensible deeds, keeping the stomach away from questionable food, this is mushtabe, doubtful food, at the time for breaking the fast. It is meaningless to fast, to abstain from lawful food, only than to break one's fast and eat something that is unlawful. Right? A man who fasts like this may be compared to one who builds a castle but demolishes a city. <laughs> Imam is a deep example. <laughs> right? Imagine somebody who builds a home and then he destroys the whole city. <laughs> so when he did the fast, he built the home. But then, let's say, he ate from interest earnings, interest income. So that's unlawful earnings. So that means his any food that is purchased and acquired through unlawful income that food becomes unlawful. It may technically be halal in and of itself. It may be halal, zabiha, meat. It may be bread. It may be oranges. 
right? In of itself, halal. But because it was purchased and acquired through unlawful wealth, eating that food becomes unlawful for that person. That's very important in the month of Ramadan. We have to make sure that our income, our earning, our salary, the revenue from the company that we work. And let me explain this. If anybody wants to know, is my salary halal? So your salary being halal is based on two factors. I'll just give you the formula. You will be able to apply the formula yourself on your own individual situation, your own individual profession. It's a universal formula. Whether your salary is halal or not is based on two things. Number one, is the revenue of the company, firm, establishment, business, shop, whatever, institution, university, hospital, which is paying your salary. Because your salary is necessarily drawn from the revenue of your employer. If the source of the revenue of your employer is halal, and or if the vast majority of it is halal, and even some ulama would say if at least the simple majority, 50.0001% is halal, that means the revenue is viewed as halal, and therefore your salary is halal. That's the first check. So, and the second check, then I'll give you some examples for you to illustrate. Second principle of the formula is, okay, that was the revenue of my employer. Second, what I personally do, my actual job description, what I amalan do practically, the work that I do for that company, is that halal? That also has to be halal. If these two things are halal, then your salary is halal. Now let me give you some examples to illustrate. So if there's a person who works for Telenor, Telenor, all of you know, we know, we have it in Pakistan also. So Telenor, now what does Telenor is going to pay? Step one, Telenor is paying your salary from its revenues, necessarily so. What is the source of Telenor's revenue? They sell mm, a cell phone talk time. And if itself is permissible to sell that, people may use their cell phones for evil, Telenor is not liable for that, and you're not liable for that if you work there. Right? In of itself, selling telephone services, cellular phone services, is jayas. That's a halal way of earning revenue. So your salary comes from that revenue, so you've passed the first check. However, second check is what do you yourself do for Telenor? So if you say, no, but I work in Telenor's finance department, and I'm in charge of fixed income deposits. Fixed income deposit means the interest-bearing uh, investments of Telenor, which is probably a few percent, maybe two, three percent of their annual revenue. But that's what I do. <laughs> okay, but in your case then, your salary is not halal, because you don't pass the second check, because what you personally are doing, that's not okay because you are involved in the interest side which is a very minor percent of Telenor. But that's what you do. So it's not halal. Understand? Okay, there could have been another example. That, okay, what do you do at Telenor? And this person could say, okay, I'm on their tech side. And whenever there's any tower that goes down, or there's some problem in the signal, so I'm the behind-the-scenes engineer, and I make sure that all the signals are functioning. So, okay? The nature of your work is halal. The revenue from which your salary is drawn is halal. Your salary is halal. So two people, employees of the same company, one salary is halal, one is not halal. You understand from the example? Another example. A person works at a bank. So I'm assuming there must be something. Citibank, maybe you've heard of it, it exists in Norway, right? Now let's look at now let me reverse it so you understand. Well tell let me just do it in the same order. So the first thing is that what your salary is drawn from the revenue of Citibank. So what is the source of revenue of Citibank? The vast majority of Citibank revenue is from interest-based income. That they charge on loans, consumer loan, but especially commercial loan, investment loan, and their investment banking. And that's not permissible. Right? So because the hukam of their revenue is not halal, and your salary is necessarily drawn from that revenue, your salary is not halal. Even if you pass the second check, because you have to pass both checks, only two checks Allah Ta'ala has put. Second check doesn't mean a person says, no, but I'm in the IT department and I'm in their help desk. And whenever any one of their computers stops working, they call me up and I go up and I fix their computer. 
to get shared rights. That itself is permissible to fix people's computers, to reinstall the software, to troubleshoot, right? To teach them how to use Microsoft Excel, whatever else that people do. This, you pass the second check that your actual job function is halal, but you didn't pass the first check. Now, the reason why people find this so diff- difficult in banking, right, is that banking is the most civilized sin. People do it wearing a three-piece suit and a tie in a very nice office with very good behavior. So it doesn't appear to us to be a sin. So sometimes I have to use a bit of a crude example to make people understand. So imagine if there is a... It's a crude example, and I don't like using these examples, but I have to do it to make you people understand. You think that it's okay I can work in the IT department. Not you, but some people think. Maybe one of you thinks that it's okay to work in the IT department of Citibank because I'm just doing IT. And you're not even embarrassed and people tell people, oh, I work in the... And they give their card. Now, I just want you to replace Citibank with some pornographic industry. Would you feel comfortable or would you feel embarrassed saying this to a fellow Muslim? Or if you were trying to get married, would you feel comfortable or embarrassed saying this to the girl's father that I work for this pornographic industry? But I don't take the pictures, I don't look at the pictures, I'm in the computer, I manage their subscription. And if anybody sends an email saying, oh, I didn't get the magazine this month, it's my job to make sure that they're there. So I'm in the computer side. Um, you would die before you did that. <laughs> and you would never give out that card. <laughs> and you would never tell anyone in the room that you do this job for that company. Because you know that even though my job is computers, the company I'm doing it for <laughs> is engaged in sinful activity. There's no difference between the banking industry and the pornography industry. Sin is sin. Yes, one is viewed as civilized today. And one, the world also views as uncivilized. But our definition of sin is not what society views as acceptable or unacceptable. Our definition of sin is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala views as acceptable and unacceptable. No matter how civilized and outwardly dignified form the world might give it. Sin is sin. In fact, Sayyidina Sallallahu Alaihi even lumped these two sins together in one hadith when he mentioned the alamat of qiyamah, the signs of the Day of Judgment. So there are all types of different signs. There's one set of signs that those signs that will appear within the Ummah. And one thing the Prophet said in one of these is that towards the end of time, zina and riba will become widespread in my Ummah. So who is linking these two things together? Not me telling you banking and pornography industry is linking. Say not a full to link these two things together. Now believe me, if it's a sign of the day of judgment, it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. The riba being widespread in this ummah is a sign of the end of time. Oh, what? what? That should be enough. Again, remember Yaqeen. If you believe in the Prophet and the Prophet, you have to have Yaqeen in his words. Even rationing it should make you have Yaqeen, because they could never predict this. Fourteen years ago, Sahaba probably would have been thinking, what are you talking about? How could that ever happen? <laughs> the Sahaba would never have understood how the Prophet was saying this. How would that ever happen? that these two things will be widespread in the Ummah. We are giving our lives and Badr and Uhud to remove these things from the world. And you're telling us that in our very own Ummah, these things are going to be widespread. Sahaba must have been stunned. Right? They could never realize. Me and you can understand what the Prophet was saying. Hmm? So this was a bit of a clarification explanation that I wanted to tell you. That unlawful earning. So that was one point in Mom's eyes I made. And otherwise, unlawful food could also be if somebody was so foolish to actually eat food that's not halal, but hard to imagine anybody would be that foolish, right? That they pass in Ramadan and then they break their fast with food that is haram, right? Many Mom's I gave that example. So lawful food is injurious in quantity, not in quality. So fasting is to reduce the form. That is going to come as the next point, okay, about overeating. A person might well give up excessive use of medicine from fear of ill effects, but he would be a fool to switch to taking poison. 
The unlawful is a poison. Unlawful food, unlawful income, anything that is haram is a poison deadly to our being. While what is halal, what is lawful is a medicine beneficial in small doses but harmful in excess. Another beautiful example. That halal is halal. But like they say, you know, actually they, I think they may say it wrongly. They say in English, if Indian, it may be an American expression, but you can never have too much of a good thing. But asking also, yes, you can have too much of a good thing. There is such a thing as too much of a good thing. It's called Israel. So exactly, exactly what they say is Allah talks to the Quran. Kudu, washribu, walat, ishribu. Eat, drink, but don't be excessive. Eat from the lawful, drink from the lawful, but don't be excessive in that lawful. So means Allah Ta'ala has delineated a limit, had, and that line is Israel. So there is too much of a good thing. Alright? And that's what exactly Muhammad Allah is mentioning over here. Now comes that hadith that we had mentioned to you. So the object of fasting is to induce moderation. Sayyidina Rasulullah said, how many of those who fast get nothing from it but hunger and thirst? This has been taken to mean those who break their fast on unlawful food. And this is another way he came on commenting on this hadith. Some say it refers to those who, it refers to those who abstain from lawful food but break their fast on human flesh through backbiting, which is unlawful. Others consider it an allusion to those who do not guard their organs from sin. That's an explanation I'm giving, right? That they don't stay away from sin, but they stay away from food and drink, so the only thing they get is hunger and thirst. What they don't get is that taqwa. Alright. Avoid overeating. Well, one of the clarifications I want to make, that in order to be re- removed from interest, you just have to be removed one degree. That's sufficient. This is another misconception that people have today. That no, the whole economy is interest-based, so you can never save yourself from it anyway, so therefore there is no harm working in city life. No. Sharia requires you to save yourself one degree. You're right, within two, three, four degrees, there will be some connection. It doesn't matter. You are liable for the immediate connection that you make. I'll give you an example. If there's a person who sells fruit, right? So he has a fruit cart, he sells apples and oranges and bananas. And he knows that where he parks his fruit cart every day, right in front of him in the house, is owned by the president of Citibank. When the president of Citibank comes out of his house and buys apples from him, he can sell him the apples. 100%, 100% that. He can sell him, here's 12 apples, and give me whatever it is, 10 kroner. Because there's no interest in that transaction. He sold apples and he got money that is giant. That person earned the money to buy the apples through an unlawful way. But that doesn't, it's not a transitive effect. It doesn't affect this transaction. So it's 100% from the food. You have a store, you have no idea from the people who are walking into your store whether their wealth is haram or halal. Whatever type of store you have, there's no way you could check that. That would be impossible for you to check. The only thing you have to check is that are you giving them a lawful good and service for the money they're giving you in this sale? Is your transaction with them halal? Whatever transaction they did prior to they met you, which enabled them to get the money, you're not liable for that. You're just liable for the transaction with them. Therefore, some people can try to argue that no will tell or itself began by taking an interest-bearing loan, investment financing, and that's how they began their company. So it's all interest in the end. Maybe all interest in the end, but is it in the end? All that Islam looks at is it interest in your end or not? The interface, like you say, there's a user interface. Your interface with your money has to be halal. There may be so many levels in the back end, when you go back, there may be problems. You're only liable for your interface. All right? Okay, so next point is avoid overeating. Next point for Ramadan and to have the fasting of the Salihin is to avoid overeating. Very simply, what Imam Azar is going to mention here is that the whole purpose of the fast was to increase our taqwa, remember? And so actually we mentioned these 10 features of Ramadan. The 11th feature of Ramadan technically is the fast. 
that Allah Ta'ala has put a feature in Ramadan which enables us to get taqwa. What is that? This act of being hungry and thirsty. That actually helps us in getting taqwa. So because that being hungry and thirsty helps us in getting taqwa, then from Maghrib to Fajr, we don't want to destroy that hunger and thirst by overeating. So the simple practical rule I will give you is that in any 24-hour period in Ramadan, the amount of food and drink you eat should be less than the 24-hour period after Ramadan. Obviously, you're fasting and talking about the amount you eat from Maghrib to Fajr. And you'll notice many people, it's not the same. And in Pakistani culture, though it's a common joke, that people gain weight in Ramadan. Yes, they literally gain weight in Ramadan. Why? Because the amount they eat from Maghrib to Fajr in Ramadan is more than they normally eat in a 24-hour period. That's known as overeating. So don't do that. That's foolish. <laughs> you spent all that hard work fasting, and then you destroyed it by overeating. Hmm? Don't you see the athlete when he's preparing for Olympics? Hmm? He exercises and trains all day. Does he go and eat fatty and greasy foods all night? No way. You know, that'd be so foolish to do that. I would destroy my entire day of training by having that heavy meal. He won't do it. Why? For what sake is he sacrificing that desire? For the sake of some physical sport. <laughs> we cannot control our desire for the sake of spiritual taqwa. <laughs> What's more valuable, physical sport or spiritual taqwa? So don't overeat at night. Ramadan is not the month of the samosa and pakora. This is the wrong month for this. Eat, I, I give you full ijazah to overeat on Eid. Yes, you can even overeat on Eid, no problem. Allah Ta'ala put, and that's another secret, Allah Ta'ala put barak on Eid. <laughs> Eid is that day that no matter how much you eat, the overeating won't affect you negatively. <laughs> day, special day like that. Go all out on Eid. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, because you're the guest of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Yes. On day of Eid, everything you eat and drink, you are the guest of Allah SWT, He is the host. Outwardly, maybe your family, your friends, your neighbors were those. Actually, it's Allah SWT who is the host on Eid. That's another story. That's for Eid now. <laughs> Eid is also actually a special feature of Ramadan. I think we could have added that to the list. The fact that after Ramadan comes for Eid, that itself is a feature of Ramadan. That it ends in this celebration and joy and pleasure and happiness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Khair. So simple rule that is eat less, even slightly less, even if you say 5%, even that's fine. Start with whatever you're capable of. But in Ramadan, you should eat 5% less in Ramadan than you did before. Right, now let's go back to the text. The page 7 8, avoid overeating. Not to overindulge in lawful food at the time of breaking fast to the point of stuffing one's belly. Sounds familiar? Hmm? There is no receptacle more odious to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than a belly stuffed full with lawful food. Of what use is the fast as a means of conquering Allah ta'ala's enemy and obeying Afmin Shaitan and obeying your nafs if at the time of breaking the fast one not only makes up for all one has missed during the daytime, but perhaps also indulges in a variety of extra foods. So this makes it clear it's not just Pakistani culture. Because the Mahmoud was always right <laughs> 900 years ago. It has even become the custom to stock up for Ramadan with all kinds of food stuffs so that more is consumed during that time than in the course of several other months put together. It is well known that the object of fasting is to experience hunger and to check desire in order to reinforce the nafs in taqwa. If the stomach is starved from early morning till evening so that its appetite is aroused and its craving intensified and it is then offered delicacies and allowed to eat its fill, its taste for pleasure is increased and the force of the nafs is exaggerated, amplified. Passions are activated which would have lain dormant under normal conditions. Yes, we actually have had people come and tell us this. 
that in Ramadan at night they did some type of sin. And they're amazed even at themselves that what happened to me? It was Ramadan and I did fast. Answer was simply this, they overate. And then it aroused a desire and passion in them which no, they didn't even have to face on normal conditions. So they gave it to him. Allah. Indeed. So the spirit and secret nature of fasting, but secret nature means the, the real inner blessing, the kernel, the kernel, the crux of fasting, is to weaken the forces which are shaitan's means of leading us back to evil. That is nafs. It is therefore essential to cut down one's intake to at least what one would consume on a normal night, not when fasting. Because what you would normally eat at night, if you would have breakfast and lunch that day, that's how much you should eat in the night of Ramadan. That's what it means. Right? No benefit is derived from the fast if one consumes as much as one would usually take during the day and night combined. What does that mean? That after Maghrib you have brunch, and after Taraweeh you have dinner, and in Sahur again you have brunch. Moreover, one of the properties, can, proprieties, means that one of the adab, the adab of fasting, consists in taking little sleep during the daytime, so that one feels the hunger and thirst, and becomes conscious of the weakening of one's powers, with the consequent purification of the heart. What does it mean to people who eat a lot at night? You'll find they sleep a lot during the day. There's so many people coming. That, oh, I don't know what to do in Ramadan. I'm so sleepy in the day. I sleep till Zohar and Masla. And the young man is free. He can just, he can just change the timetable. It's very simple. He just makes the PM into AM and the AM into PM. So what does he do? He'll sleep from 5 AM to 3 PM. And then he gets up and there's hardly a fast for him from 3 PM to Bhagavad hmm? And then he eats all night and then he sleeps all day. And it's not just, I'm telling you, a very large number of people do this. So this is negating the whole purpose of fasting. They don't feel the hunger. In other words, they eat so much at night and sleep so much at day. They do both. They eat so much at night and sleep so much at day that they don't actually feel the hunger that Allah Ta'ala wanted them to feel the alakum tattakun so they would get that taqwa. It's almost like what the Bani Israel used to do. Allah Ta'ala said, don't fish on Saturday. So they cast the nets on Friday, right? And then they broke in the fish on Sunday. Basically, they ended up taking a loophole. So this is actually like a loophole. So tell tell you, you want me to feel hunger and thirst so I get taqwa? Hmm. No, what I'll do is I'll eat triple at night and sleep double during the day and I won't feel the hunger and thirst. Hmm. Allah wanted you to feel the hunger and thirst so you got taqwa. Now you understand what Imam Zahra is going to say. Hmm? So one should let a certain degree of weakness carry over into the night, making it easier to perform the night prayers. Yes, this happens. Some people, they eat so much after Maghrib. He's talking about the Hajj, but I'll give you even of them. They can't stand in Taraweeh. They get drowsy in Taraweeh. They can't concentrate on Quran in Taraweeh. Even though the month of Quran, Allah has made the Quran easier to understand. It's the closest they could have come to Quran. And they've let themselves fall short because they ate so much from Maghrib tradition. Even sometimes people literally even say the sentence or Literally, listen, they were saying that oh today we really ate a lot. I don't think we can go for Taravi tonight. They say it. <laughs> and they do it. They don't go. <laughs> because they ate so much and they're right. They ate so much they're not capable of standing that long. How foolish. <laughs> foolish, right? Could you ever see a student who eats so much the night before the exam that he is bloated and he comes to the exam? He'll say, no way. I have to be sharp. I have to be alert. I have to be fresh. I won't overeat. I'll just take a small sandwich and a cup of coffee and I'm going in for the exam. Hmm. That's the way you should be in Ramadan. I'm going for Taraweeh. I can't overeat all. I can't eat all this stuff. I fasted the whole day so I would be fresh and alert for this worship at night. I can't be having these greasy, oily, fatty foods right now. If the Olympic athlete can do it, the student in Zanzi can do it. Hmm? The politicians, for the sake of elections, if you see them in elections, they just eat on the run. They don't have no time, no time to eat. 
I have to give this page, this campaign rally, I'm up 18 hours. They just eat on the run. Why? Because they want to contest elections. <laughs> so people of the dunya for these worldly purposes can manage their diet. And Allah tells put so much barakat in Ramadan for our spiritual purposes we can't manage our diet in this month. So it's easier to perform the Tahajjud prayer to recite awraz, means different dhikras, kar, duas, tikfar, dhirjri, tasbihah, mrakabah, etc. It may then be that shaitan will not hover around one's heart and that one will behold the kingdom of heaven. The night of Laylul Qadr represents the night on which something of this kingdom is revealed. What does he mean here? Okay, it may then be that shaitan will, shaitan won't be there, right? Shaitan will not hover around one's heart because shaitan will locked up. But, right, that on Laylul Qadr, and remember, we mentioned this too, right? All the angels come down. So actually, when you go into Jannah, when inshallah, we all go into Jannah, inshallah, out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the angels will also be there. Right? So the presence of the angels is actually a quote-unquote heavenly type thing. Heavenly experience. So when they all come down to earth on that night, it's a little bit, not in every sense, earth remains earth, right? But in this one sense, it becomes like heaven on earth. Because the heavenly celestial beings, right, who normally do tawaf around the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they've all come down on this layout to come. So then, this is what then, Imam Azai says, Allah ta'ala is my friend, and Allah will see they don't come. Indeed, we sent down this Quran on them, on layout to come. Anyone who puts a bag of food between his heart and his breast becomes blind to this revelation. It means they don't feel. They're too bloated. If a person says, I'm too bloated to even pray Tarawih, then he's going to be way too bloated to experience Layl together and feel those Anwarat and Barakat coming on that night. Nor is keeping the stomach empty sufficient to remove the veil unless one also empties the mind of everything but Allah SWT. That is the entire matter and the starting point of it all is cutting down on food. And that's what Allah SWT did in Qur'an. This is what he told us. So what's the starting point of this? Before la'alakum tattakun, that was then, what was the beginning? Kutub alaykum asiyam. Starting point is you cut down on the food. Now, what does this mean? And this is what we call, there's a relationship between the zahir and the batin in our being. The outward aspect of fasting, staying away from food and drink. The bottom aspect of fasting, getting taqwa. So the better you are at the desire part, the better you will get the bottom part. That's it. And the worse you are at the desire part, the worse you will be at getting at the bottom part. That's why Imam Muhammad is saying that we should not mm, overeat. So, ideally, this is also a good month to implement the sunnahs of eating. So I will very briefly tell you what the sunnahs are. And again, it may be very baby stuff, and all of you would have known it, but we don't do amal on it. First sunnah, Sayyidina Rasulullah taught us that we should stop eating when we still feel slightly hungry. Then don't eat to your complete full. Don't wait till you're completely satiated and then stop. Stop eating when you feel slightly hungry still. So for example, you know, like the gas tank, right? So one thing is to say, fill it up, don't fill it up. <laughs> right? Put it three quarters, 80% full, and leave it like that. Right? Second sunnah of eating. And some of you may have heard this today, the same sunnah that leaves three spaces in your stomach. One space for food, and one space for water, and one space for air. So if you were to follow that strictly, that would be one third. I still was nice, I gave you 75, 80%. Hmm? Next one of eating is saying also some nasty talk that a person should chew a lot when they eat. And all these modern science will tell you that either you do the chewing here or your stomach will have to do the digesting here. Hmm? The more chewing you do here, the less digesting your stomach has to do. The less digesting your stomach has to do, the less blood your stomach draws. The less blood your stomach draws, the more blood remains in your mind, and the less tired you feel. So one reason sometimes we feel tired after we eat isn't just the amount, it's because we didn't chew properly. 
so the stomach has to do more work to digest it. Actually, we actually ate a reasonable amount. But because we didn't chew properly, the stomach has to do more work to digest it, so the blood flows from the brain into the stomach muscle, and that makes us feel tired. So if we do amal on this sunnah, we should chew a lot. That's why even traditionally parents would always teach it to the children, that you should always chew your food. All right? Chew it so much that then it just naturally swells. As opposed to quickly swallowing it because you're preparing the next slice of biryani and rice and salad perfectly mixed together and it's already coming for arrival in your runway and you have to clear the runway. Hmm? That's what you do. So you're just clearing the runway quickly because there's, mashallah, more traffic than London Heathrow. You're just bringing one after the other. Hmm? Allah Akbar. So that leads me to another sunnah. Sayyidina Rasulullah said that don't lift up the next morsel to your mouth until what is in your mouth has already been swallowed. These are very practical sunnahs of eating. If we do amal on this, you will find that you will eat, end up eating less while still feeling full. Yes, this is the way you will, this is the real diet, sunnah diet. How to reduce your calorie intake without even realizing it. Just follow these sunnahs. You will automatically reduce the calories you take. That's a real simple diet. You can try to switch to carbs, low carbs, with kale. Simply speaking, reduce your calories. Right? So here, these were a few sunnahs about eating less. Benefit of eating less. There are certain benefits of eating less. Number one is when you eat less, you will sleep less. 100% absolute guarantee. It's a directly proportional relationship. If you eat less, you will sleep less. That gives you another benefit. Because when you sleep less, you get more time. And you get more barakah in your time. And you get more time. You get more time than you can use that extra time. To do more dhikr, more ibadah, more work of deen, more ilm of deen. You will get more time. Both eating less will take less time. And then the sleeping less also gives, takes less time. And then third benefit, when you eat less, you actually will feel more strong. Because like I told you, when you're overweight, you're bloated. When you eat less in this sense, you'll feel more alert, more strong. So then you'll be more productive and efficient in your time. You'll see when you're overweight, you can't really do any real work. You're a bit numbed, right? But when you eat the right amount, you're completely alert. You're fresh. So then you will be able to focus on your ibadah more, focus on your zikr more, feel Allah Ta'ala more in your ibadah. Fourth benefit is that when you eat less, you spend less on yourself. And therefore you can spend more on others, more sadaqah. When you eat less, your grocery bill will go down even a little bit. You can give more sadaqah. Your eating less may enable others to eat more who are below the poverty line. Right? And this is a very important aspect of Ramadan also, was to feel compassion for the poor. This is why Sayyidina Rasulullah himself also used to greatly increase the amount of sadaqah and charity he used to give in this month. And the notion was that we would increase that charity because we felt, we tasted, just a glimpse, but still we felt it, the hunger of the poor. But if you do this overeating and sleeping in the day, you will never even get a glimpse of what type of the hunger of the poor is. You know, I'll give you my own example once. One time I was traveling, and I was very busy. And because of that, I didn't have dinner one night, and the next day I didn't have breakfast, the next day I didn't have lunch, and so by the time it was night for dinner, the night she was hungry. I'm a thin guy, so it's just, it's nothing special, it's just Allah Allah made me this way, I don't normally get hungry. But that day I got hungry, <laughs> right? And amazingly, that day I had very, almost no food. So, just because I hadn't gone to the grocery store and it was very late when I came back and the stores were closed where I was staying, and I had like one slice of bread, and I don't know what, like something like jam or something like that in the fridge. And I ate it, and I remember eating it and be like, wow, I'm still hungry, right? And then I remember thinking that, you know, how many people in this world eat? And after they eat, they have this feeling that I'm still hungry. How many children are like that in the world? That they do get a little something to eat. But after they eat, they still feel hungry. And me, maybe for the first time in my life, I had this feeling that I actually ate, and after eating, I still felt hungry. So Allah Ta'ala blessed us so much, and we never get this feeling. 
Because if ever after we eat one thing, we still feel hungry, we eat the second thing. <laughs> Instantly. There's no problem for us. Hmm? So there's so many people in this world who either don't get to eat, or there's a lot who do eat, but every single time they eat, they're still hungry. They're surviving. They eat enough to survive. They eat enough to function. But they're still hungry. This is new, was a new feeling for me, and I never forget that night. Hmm? Ajit. It's just natural. It wasn't me. It happens. To, it will happen to any one of us. Allah Ta'ala wants to happen this month. He wants us to feel these different types of hunger so we get the compassion for the poor. That's why and we really pay our zakat properly to the poor as opposed to giving it in all types of healer zakat. No. Zakat should go to the poor. Zakat is the hug of the poor that's an amanat with you. It doesn't go to any institution, not even masjid, not even madrasa. I mean, unless the students of the mothers are poor and it's different, you can give it to the mothers of students like that. But it doesn't go to institution, it goes to the poor people. It goes to people's transfer of income from people above the poverty line to people below the poverty line. That's the philosophy of the God. And it's a beautiful philosophy. Right? Very simple. Very simple. So these were some of the benefits of eating less. Right? And also, we've mentioned some harms of eating more. The real benefit of eating less is taqwa. Why? What's the connection? Now I want to explain to you. Whenever you eat more than your body needs, and even today nutritionists and doctors will tell you your body needs, I think, I can't remember, maybe 2,000, 2,500 calories a day. Whenever extra calories you eat, you're not feeding your body, you're feeding your nuts. You feed your nafs. Can you imagine that person who is so foolish that he hand feeds his nafs himself <laughs> and then he complains that my nafs overpowers me and makes me do sin. Khud nafs ko palta hai khilata hai. Or phir shikwa karta hai ke nafs mush pur sawal ho jata hai. I said the same thing earlier that I said in English. Hmm? So this is why when you stop eating more and you eat less then you get that taqwa. That's the real taqwa of Ramadan. Because what happens in Ramadan is you stop feeding your nafs. When you stop feeding your nafs, then taqwa becomes more in reach. And that's from eating less. That's from not overeating. That's from every now and then getting a glimpse and taste of hunger. That's how they tame that wild animal. What, how do they tame the wild animal? They reduce its food. That's all they have to do. All of animal psychology, that's all it is. We just reduce its food. Then the beast part of the animal will go down. It will still be animal, still be alive, still can run. In fact, we want to tame it so it can run. Wild horse, for example. But the beast part of it will be tamed simply we reduce its food. <laughs> the nuts is the animal side of us. <laughs> so the beast part of the nuts will be tamed simply by reducing its food. This is the link between fasting and la'allukum tattaku. This is why we get more taqwa in this month of Ramadan. Okay, getting back to the text. Now, page number 79. And this is the sixth and final point. And Imam al I mentioned this here about how to get the fast of the Salihin. For those of you who may have joined a bit late, Imam al Azari mentioned that there's three levels of fasting. One of the ordinary believers, Mu'mineen, that's just that they abstain from food, drink, and lawful relations. Second is the fasting of the Salihin, that they abstain from food, drink, lawful relations, and they protect their limbs and organs from all And he gave six steps here which is what we meant by the inner dimensions of the fasting. Six steps so that we get that Basin fast and we get the fast of the Salaheen. So the sixth thing is to look to Allah with fear and hope. That's what the Allah Iman al Khawfi was done. The real Iman lies in between, means in the merging of fear and hope. Fear of displeasing Allah Ta'ala, hope in His mercy. Fear of being rejected by Allah Ta'ala, hope that He will accept us. Hmm? 
fear and hope. Both of these feelings have to be there. So Imam Zarata writes, and after the fast has been broken, the heart should swing like a pendulum between fear and hope. Why? For one does not know if one's fast has been accepted, so that and whether one will find favor with Allah Ta'ala, or whether the fast has been rejected, and that means that they will be amongst the people that Allah Ta'ala abhors, that dislikes. This is how one should, in fact, be at the end of any act of ibadah. That I'm hopeful that Allah Ta'ala will accept it, but I'm also scared what if it, Allah Ta'ala says it's unworthy of being accepted. It is related that Shaykh Hassan al Basri Allah Ta'ala, that he once passed by a group of people who were laughing and happily. He said, Allah Ta'ala has made the month of Ramadan a race course. Hmm? This is why he's telling them in, uh, in Denmark, uh, become the athlete of Ramadan. Become the athlete of Ramadan. Has made the month of Ramadan a race course on which his creatures compete in his worship. Some have come in first and won, while others have lagged behind and lost. It is absolutely amazing to find anybody laughing and playing about on the day when success attends the victors and failure the losers. By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way to the khasirun, so we can call it losers in English. By Allah, if the veil were lifted off, means if a person could see this reality, the doer of good would surely be preoccupied with his good works, and the evil doer with his evil deeds. Which does it mean that if people could really see, right, what happened to them. So the person who does good amal, he would hasten towards good amal. And the person who does evil, he would be preoccupied, he would be worried and terrified over the evil of his deeds. In other words, the man whose fast has been accepted will be preoccupied with this hope, will be too full of joy to indulge in idle sport and talk. And the one whose fast was rejected, there would be in so much remorse that they also could not engage in idle laughter and talk. Al-Ahnaf ibn Qaysir Allah Ta'ala said, Oh, was reported that he said to me as well, told that you're an aged elder, you're an old man, fasting would make you weak. So he replied, by this I am making ready for a long journey. As to the fasting is going to make me strong for my long journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is easier to endure. I mean, if it's difficult for me to obey Allah ta'ala, I'd rather endure this difficulty of fasting in my old age, rather than his punishment that maybe my old age was not a genuine excuse and fasting is fard on me and if I leave that fast which is fard and I don't have an excuse to leave it then Allah Ta'ala will punish me. So they weren't so quick to excuse themselves, right? Today people, mashallah, <laughs> they hear this is true but that if a person is genuinely sick then it's permissible for them not to fast and they'll have to make up that fast at a later date. So, but people very quickly give themselves sick leave. They approve their own sick leave. They just have a slight forecast that maybe I'll get a headache on two sick to pass the day. They let oneself off the hook too quickly. Should be more careful that what if, actually, no, I'm not at that level of sickness, which is a legitimate excuse for not fasting. And then, if I'm not at that level, and I don't fast, the not fasting would be a means of getting a little spontal upset with me. So I shouldn't take that chance. Better than I try, right, and fast. And again, don't take this to another extreme, that somebody tries to have more taqwa than they need to, that if you generally are sick, then you shouldn't fast. Or if a muttaqi, muttaqi Muslim doctor has told you that your medical condition, muttaqi Muslim, two conditions, muttaqi Muslim, muttaqi Muslim doctor, tells you that you have a medical condition and it happens and some people have such conditions that your medical condition precludes you from fasting then you should not fast. Actually the teaching of deen in such a situation is it's better for you not to fast because this is what Allah Ta'ala wills that when you have genuine certified excuse then you should be humble and out of humility to take that excuse. Right? So then Imam Azai concluded this part that such are the inwardly significant meaning of fasting. Now he says an importance of observing these inward aspects. Now you may say, quote, suppose someone confines him or herself to curbing his or her appetite for food and drink and lawful relations 
to the neglect of these inward aspects. They don't do these six things that you mentioned above. So according to the fuqaha, according to the jurist, his fast is valid. They'll tell us, they'll give fatwa that yes, you didn't eat and drink and do law right from Padr to your fast is valid. Sehat is valid, correct. So what are we to make of this? So the Imam Muhammad is a response that you must realize that those versed in the external requirements of the law and keep in mind your brother the Imam Al-Muhazayat was a Shafi Saqi of the highest caliber. Right? But there is something he's some stranger to think. He's a jurist himself. Right? He's a jurist himself. You must realize that those verbs in the external requirements of the law based their formal stipulations means furu and fatawa on evidence less cogent than the proofs we have advanced in support of these internal prerequisites, especially those relating to backbiting and the like. Because you remember he had quite a few hadith on this issue of backbiting. However, scholars of external legality are concerned only with such obligations as fall within the capacity of the ordinary heedless people who are wholly caught up in the affairs of this world. It means that they are only writing about the first degree of fasting which was the ordinary fasting. All of law is just going to talk about that. This is spirituality. It's talking about a level higher than the law. Doesn't mean outside the law. Higher doesn't mean outside. It's within Sharia. But it's now a concern that is outside the realm of fiqh and Sharia. It's not talking about legality. It's talking about the ethics of fasting. The spiritual aspects of fasting. The higher etiquettes and adam of fasting. So for those learned in knowledge of the Akhirah, the meaning they attach to siha to validity is acceptance is kubudiya. You see, one thing is, is an act legally valid. Yes. One thing, okay, but was that act accepted by Allah Ta'ala? What does accepted mean? Did I get that? So obviously, oh, you would also know if a person still lies, still sins, how can they get from that fast? Even though the fast is legally valid, they won't get they're not going to get the kubudiya of the fast. That's all Imam has to say. So going to their understanding, the goal of fasting is the acquisition of one of the qualities of Allah SWT, namely steadfastness. What does this mean? So Sayyidina Rasulullah SAW said in the Hadith, the khalluku bi khulukillah, that you must adorn yourself with the attributes of Allah SWT. Now this doesn't mean all the attributes. There are certain attributes that no human can or should ever try to acquire. Such as Allah Ta'ala is al mutakabbir Allah Ta'ala is Al-Akbar. No human being can get that. But Allah Ta'ala is Al-Kareem. And our deen teaches us that we also are supposed to be Kareem with one another. Allah Ta'ala is Al-Rahim. And say also some many hadith that show be Rahim to others so that Allah Ta'ala will be Rahim to you. We're supposed to be merciful to others. Right? So there's certain attributes of Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala that obviously not that in any way we can acquire them in the way that Allah Ta'ala has them. But the same Attributes should be in us at the human level. Such as being Rahim, such as being Kareem, such as being forgiving of others' faults, right? Overlooking of others' just like we want Allah not to forgive us. We should be forgiving of others. You understand? So this one attribute is uh, Samadhiya. What does that mean, right? So this is... Hmm, how can I explain this? This is a bit difficult thing to explain. Uh... You can understand it like this in in a certain sense. No human being can ever be like Allah Ta'ala in any way, right? No matter the most merciful human being, his mercy is nothing compared to even one drop of Allah Ta'ala's mercy. But there is some resemblance, right? Even if distant, but mercy is and there's mercy, right? So here what it means is that Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala is beyond any physical aspect. It means Allah Ta'ala does not eat, Allah Ta'ala does not drink, right? Allah Ta'ala doesn't have any such urges or needs, relations, right? So Allah Ta'ala doesn't have any of these things. He's purely a, a, a pure non physical, purely spiritual being, to put it in simple senses. Now if you think it never be like that, we are a physical and spiritual mix. We can never change that about ourselves. However, in the process of the fasting, what Imam is saying is that Allah Ta'ala wants us to numb, downplay our physical aspect. 
because that will enable our spiritual aspect to come out. La'allakum tattakum. And we're so busy in physical, right? That sometimes our spiritual remains dormant. So hence, this is another way I want to be making the jump between staying away from physical eating and drinking and relations and how does that enable you to get spiritual taqwa. Because when you dampen the physical, you unlock and unleash the spiritual. And ultimately, Allah SWT is, has no physicality. What does it mean? He doesn't have any body, he doesn't have any shape, right? He doesn't have any bodily needs. He doesn't have any of those things, right? Okay. As well as following the example of the angels by abstaining as far as possible from the desires of the flesh. Now, the angels are physical. They have bodies, right? They have a form, they have a shape. So they're like us in that sense. And both of us are not like Allah Ta'ala in that sense. Allah Ta'ala doesn't have any form and shape and body and flesh, right? But the angels are different than us in this sense that the angels don't have a nafs. Angels have ruh, they don't have nafs. You understand? They have a ruh, they have a body. Their body is made of nur, but it isn't a body, it's a form. It's a surah, it's a jisant, right? But it's made of nur. But they don't have a nafs. Okay? So they are immune to such passions of the nafs. They don't have a nafs. So they're completely free of that. So we are trying, and that's one of the reasons they have this qurb to Allah SWT. So Allah SWT is trying in the month of Ramadan for us to diminish our physical self, to diminish our nafs. So we unlock, because we also have a ruh, like the angels do. So we unlock the ruh side of us, the spiritual side of us. That's what Imam is trying to explain here. And it's a bit confusing in the English. The human status is superior to that of animals. Yes, insan is superior to the animal world. Since humans are able, by the light of reason, to tame their lust. In other words, that animals also have enough. So that sense, humans and animals are similar. We both have enough. The difference is that humans have the ability to do mujahid of the nafs. Right? When han nafsa anul hawa, the human can train themselves, discipline themselves to stop their nafs. The animal doesn't have that ability. When the animal's nafs gets excited, it can't, there's no, it cannot, there's no self-control. Animals have no self-control. That's why normally even in English also, when somebody just cannot show self-control in their behavior, we tell them, you're acting like an animal. We actually say that to them, right? Because they don't have any self-control, right? So animals are similar to humans. They, we both have nafs, but different in the sense that they have no possibility of self-control. We have a possibility of self-control. If we use that possibility of self-control, then even though despite having enough, we become more closer to the angels. And if we don't use our possibility of having self-control, then Allah says in the Quran, then that person, human, who cannot exercise self-control on his nuts, they're like cattle, they're like animals. Baghum azal not even worse. Why? Because if you're not able to do self-control and you don't do it, is that worse for the person who is able to do it and doesn't do it? Obviously that one is worse, the one who is able to do it and didn't do it. So that's why they're worse than animals. Gee, the way Imam is looking. I mean, we never think about these things. We never even think about angels. Maybe today we're talking about angels and some of us have not even thought about angels for maybe years. Maybe years have gone by. But these people were deeply steeped in Quran and Hadith. So the angels are mentioned. So many places in Quran Hadith. So it was part of their world view. It was part of their life and they understood these things. Right? Mm. So, in, in essence, on the top of page, what page number is this? 81. The one that sums it up the humans are superior to animals, yet inferior to angels, in that the human is subject to carnality, means to base desires, and put to the test in combat with their nafs and the temptations of their nafs. Whenever a person falls prey to their unlawful, lustful desire, then they sink to the lowest of the low, 
and they join like that. They join the animal herd. They become animalistic. But whenever they curb their desire, then they rise to the highest of the high, and they become more angelic. And that's why you, all of you know, in our dean, that our dean teaches us that human beings have the potential to be even better than angels. Ashrafal Mabdukah. And human beings have the potential to be worse than animals. So this is all that is opening up to us a detailed explanation of this reality. Right? So the angels are near the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I told you this before, the malaika, muqallabun, that they're close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why they get to do tawaf around the harsh, right? They get that good, they get this maqam of good with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those who follow their example and model themselves on their character will likewise draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What was their example? They don't even have enough. How can a human being model themselves after that? That the human doesn't have a nafs that disobeys Allah. That's called nafs al It's in Quran. It's nafs al-Mara, nafs al-Mama, nafs al So that human being that makes his nafs into nafs al means he's not on self after the angels. Because nafs al means no nafs al And that's the same thing the angels are. They're no nafs. Okay? So, so to resemble one who is near is to be near. It means that this person now is nafsul mutminna, he resembles the angels, the angels are muqarrab, so the person who is nafsul mutminna becomes muqarrab. And all of us know that's in the Quran. What happens to the person who is nafsul mutminna? He's so close to Allah Ta'ala, what does Allah Ta'ala say? Allah Ta'ala himself calls him. Ya ayyatahan nafsul mutminna. Irji'i. Come back. Return. Irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatam marbiyya. Allah Ta'ala is yearning for that person. <laughs> Allah Ta'ala is calling that person to him. That's like how Allah Ta'ala calls the angels to him. Allah Ta'ala summons the angels to him. They go to earth, they listen to whatever message, whatever command, whatever task Allah Ta'ala gives them. Hmm? It's the angels who receive this nida from Allah Ta'ala. But this insan got himself nafsul mutminna. Now he is receiving this nida, nida means call from Allah Ta'ala. Ya ayyatahan nafsul mutminna. Yidhi. Just come back. <laughs> You're done now. <laughs> You're done. You've succeeded. You've got the A plus. <laughs> Just come back. <laughs> and what stage did you come back? <laughs> that you were pleased with your rub and your rub is pleased with you. That's also with the angels. Huh? They're happy with Allah Ta'ala. They're happy with them. <laughs> That's what an angel is. <laughs> Whatever Allah Ta'ala says, they're happy. Allah Ta'ala says, you said the Adam and you're happy to do it. <laughs> Those are the angels. <laughs> Whatever Allah Ta'ala says, they're happy. If this is the secret of fasting amongst men of profound spiritual understanding, then what benefit is to be derived from simply postponing a meal and only to combine two meals after sunset, hmm? while indulging in all other passions the whole day long? Means fasting isn't just rearranging your eating. <laughs> hmm? What benefit is in just rearranging your eating and drinking? If there were any good in such conduct, then why would the Prophet have, what could he have meant, Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he said, how many of those, he repeats that indeed, how many of those who fast get nothing from it except for hunger and thirst? That's what Sayyidina Abu Dhabda Rizal said, how fine is the sleep of the wise and their non-fasting, don't they just put to shame the fasting and wakefulness of fools? A mere atom from those possessed of certainty and true piety is better and weightier than seeming mountains of worship by the misguided. I'll explain in a moment. For the same reason, one of the scholars said, how many who fast are not keeping a fast, and how many who do not keep fast are fasting. Now here, we say now, well, is not talking about Ramadan. He's just talking generally about Nafal fast, Sunnah fast, the act of fasting. He's taking it outside the discussion of Ramadan. So one person, maybe he says, okay, I make Nafal fast today, but he doesn't actually stay away from sin. And another person, okay, he's not doing any Nafal fast, but he's staying away from sin. So how much more excellent is that person who is doing the real fast, which is they abstain from sin, as opposed to that person who is just merely doing the outward fast. They abstain from food and drink in relation, but they still indulge in sin. So one person abstaining from sin and indulging in lawful food and drink. Other person abstaining from lawful food and drink, but indulging in sin. That's what he's trying to say. Right? The fasting non-faster is he who keeps his limb, means the person who is not fasting, means they abstain from sin. 
non-faster, they're still eating and drinking. So I'm talking about Ramadan. The fasting non-faster is he who keeps his limbs and organs pure of sin while still eating and drinking. And the non-fasting faster is he who goes hungry and thirsty in the name of the fast, but he's not really fasting while giving full license, permission to do sin to all of his limbs and organs. <coughs> that is why even sometimes Imam Allah explains it this way, that the people who are the Salahin, their whole life is spent fasting. Not in the first sense, not in the Awam sense, food and drink. It's different. The whole life they're fasting, meaning they keep their limbs and organs away from sin. Then one person explained it like this, that the whole world, your whole life on this world, is just a single fast. And if you spend your worldly life staying away from sin, then you will make a star by seeing Allah Ta'ala in the day of That would be your star. Now I'll explain the same thing earlier. कि आपकी पूरी जिंदगी एक रोजे की मानद है अगर आप गुनाहों से बचे जो पूरी जिंदगी गुनाह से रोजा रखता है तो उसके इफ्तारी अल्लाह ताला के दीदार होकर के आने के लिए अच्छा हम हम दैट्स अ ऑफ लाइफ दैट ऑल ऑफ लाइफ इज जस्ट अ फैक्ट एंड अल्लाह ताला Seeing Allah Ta'ala and being in Jannah is an eternal iftar, <laughs> eternal Eid, <laughs> eternity of Eid for one moment of a lifetime of the past. Hmm? Oh. <laughs> Those who understand the significance of fasting and its secret meaning, secret meaning means again its kernel, its essence, its reality, its core, its real truth, the hakika are aware that he who abstains from food, drink, and lawful relations while breaking fast does that, abstains from those, but meanwhile does not fast from sin and therefore breaks the fast of sinning by involving himself in sin is like one who performs his ablution by wiping part of his body three times in compliance with the external legal requirement yet neglects what is really important, namely the actual washing. Because of this stupidity, his ritual prayer is rejected. By contrast, he who does not abstain from eating, yet does fast in the sense of keeping his organs free from all that is unworthy, is comparable to the one who washes the proper parts of his body, but even if it's only one each. Clear that those of you who understand the sign of the Buddha understand what the is saying, right? The person who wipes but is not using any water, he's doing, doing all of it three times but doesn't use water. And the person who uses water, but even just does it once, and actually he got the real wudu. <laughs> he got the real wudu. So inshallah, such a person's ritual prayer salah is acceptable, since he has paid due attention to the essentials, even if he has omitted the details. But he who combines the two may be compared to one who not only washes each part of the body, but does so three times each, for he attends to essentials and details alike, and this constitutes perfection. So the best then is those people, Salihin, who fast from sin year-round, then in the month of Ramadan when they combine that fast with this outward fast of staying away from food and drink, then they reach that level of perfection, which is the Al-Zakum Tattakum. Because Taqwa is the perfection of the Allah Ta'ala said in the Quran, Inna akramakum indallahi atkakum. That know that those of you who are the most perfectly honored in Allah's Ta'ala's eyes are the ones who have the most perfect taqwa. So the name of perfection in our deen is taqwa. And so that means the month of Ramadan becomes a month of attaining perfection for them because they have the fasting of the Salihin. Sayyidina Rasulullah once said, the fast is an amana, it's a trust. So that each and every one of you keep this trust. And then, Allah Ta'ala, uh, then uh, Sayyidina Rasulullah recited the words of Allah Ta'ala, Indeed, Allah Ta'ala bids you to restore unto andul amanati ila ahliha, that you must restore the amanat to their proper owners, their Jew owners. Then the Prophet touched after the Prophet mentioned this verse, recited this verse, he touched his ears and touched his eyes. Saying hearing is an amana and sight is an amana. Right? It means Allah Ta'ala gave us this hearing. This is the first talk we gave you in Holy Right? On the amana. Hmm? And on everything is a trust. And these eyes weren't given to us just like that. So 
so we can use them to look at everything we want. No, the eyes were given to us as an amana. And if a person fulfills that trust, then Allah will return these eyes to us in the day of judgment and say, now take these eyes and look at Sayyidina Rasulullah Take these eyes and now look at Sayyidina Muhammad Siddiq. Take these eyes for the women. The women can do the first two also. Plus the women get extra. Take these eyes and look at Umm Mu'mineen Sayyidina Aisha Razana. Take these eyes and look at Sayyidina Fatima Razana. That's why you were given eyes. You were given sight for, to see those beauties. You weren't given sight to see these beauties of the world. <laughs> so the person who realizes that, that my eyes are an amana, they're given to me as a trust for that beauty, to see the beauty of Allah Ta'ala. Then if they live their life keeping the trust of their eyes, Allah Ta'ala will return their eyes to them. Your ears are an amana. What does it mean? You were given ears to listen to music, and to listen to lying, and to listen to backbiting. That's not why we were given hearing. So a person realizes that and stays away from these things. Then on the day of judgment, Allah Ta'ala will give a person hearing back and will say, okay, now you listen to the word of Sayyidina Rasulullah His sound, his voice. You listen to the adhan of Bilal. Then Allah Ta'ala will say, you listen to me, Allah Ta'ala recite Surah Rahman. Yes. <laughs> Allah Ta'ala will recite Surah Rahman for the believers. That's why we have ears. So a person says, no, no, I'm saving my ears. He says, why do you listen to music? Simple answer. I'm saving my ears to listen to Surah Rahman from Allah Ta'ala Ta'ala. That's why I was given ears. <laughs> I know that my, my Prophet taught me that. That's why I was given ears. So how can I use these ears for this? <laughs> right? Don't you see you have a nice little cloth that they give you to clean your glasses? Will you use it to clean the toilet? You will say, no, this cloth is not given to me to clean the toilet. It's given to me to clean the glasses. Right? So that's what Mu'min feels, that these ears weren't given to me to listen to these things. <laughs> these ears were given to me in this world to listen to Quran and Adhan and Deen and Haq and the Siha. And they were given to me so that in the Akhir I would give them back and I will listen to Kalamullah from Allah Ta'ala Himself. That's why I have these ears. So this is what Imam Zahra is saying. So, if speech were not likewise a trust of the fast, the Prophet would not have said, say, I'm fasting. Right? Meaning that if somebody wants to engage you in argument, you're supposed to say, on a sign, I'm fasting. In other words, my tongue is an amana, has been entrusted to my care. How can I release that tongue to answer your insults, to engage in argument with you? So then, Imam, well, I end this by saying, it is there, it therefore becomes apparent, <coughs> It therefore becomes apparent that every act of worship has both an outer aspect and an inner aspect. The zahir of fasting, staying away from food drink relations, and the bottom of fasting, which has been explained in detail. A husk and a kernel, that's another way just to say that husk is the outer aspect, kernel is the inner aspect. So that's what we want then that in this year, in month of Ramadan, which is coming very, very soon now, Literally around the corner. Hmm? And this year we want to try. Maybe we get it this year. But at least we try for it. We want to get the fast of something. We want this button. We have spent so many years outward fasting. We don't need anybody to help you with that anymore. Right? We know all the rules. So we can ask any mufti some particular question if we have it. But what we need is to get this inner aspect of fasting. To get this fasting of salihin. We have done Kutibadikum Asyam. Now in this year we want to do La Allahum Tantakum. Now we want the Taqwa. That Allah Ta'ala is hopeful. So we only have hope because Allah Ta'ala is hopeful. <laughs> hmm? La Allahum Tantakum means Allah Ta'ala is hopeful that we would get Taqwa in this month of Ramadan. So now we just want to conclude with a few comments and then inshallah we will make some dua. And then we will conclude today's course. <coughs> so when people ask this question, how can I prepare for the month of Ramadan? Hmm? Preparing for Ramadan. So there are two answers to this question. And the truth is that why do we even have to ask this question? 
Normally you prepare for something that's new. You prepare for something that you're doing the first time. The truth is, me and you should be experts at Ramadan by now. Hmm? We well, have done it five times, ten times, twenty times, depending on your age. Hmm? But look at our state that every year in this time of Shaban, we realize, with honesty and humility, how terribly unprepared we are for Ramadan. Hmm? Even though we've done it already so many times. Hmm? It's a reflection on the sad state of our condition. Hmm? So the fact that we continually need to prepare. So the first need we should make today is this, my preparation for Ramadan should be this, that next year I don't need this workshop. <laughs> I want to spend Ramadan this year such that next year I don't need to prepare for it when it comes, so that next year I am ready for it. That's how I want to spend Ramadan this year. I want to live in this Ramadan and be in this Ramadan and experience this Ramadan since then I never ever need to prepare for it again. Yes? Now, there are two ways we could prepare. One way is what we try to do today. So we describe the beauty of Ramadan, we describe the essence of Ramadan, we explain, we give examples, we illustrate. That was the long answer. And then there's also a short answer. That Ramadan is actually like a big tidal wave from the ocean of Allah SWT mercy. And a simple way that a person can just do is that I have no preparation, I'm just going to go and stand and let that wave come over me. Just click. One click. I'm willing to surrender. I'm willing to give up everything I was doing that was sin. I want to surrender myself and present myself to you, Allah subhanahu wa and all the mercy and rahmah and fadl and karam that you want to send down in Ramadan. That's another way to prepare for this month of Ramadan. So we did the long one all day. In this last few minutes, we want to do the second one. That's our niyyah, that's our dua, that we just want to, now after having listened to the description of the beauty of that way, now we just have to take one step and present ourselves to be overwhelmed by that wave. One thing I wanted to mention again is that I told, we had talked uh, about that Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says Shahr Ramadan and the Nay Unzila Fihim Quran that the month of Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was recited, was revealed. So a few more comments on that. What does it mean? So it means that one special feature of this month is this is the month which in the true sense, we're not talking about any ideological sense, in the true sense we can become Ahlul Qur'an. It means people for whom the Qur'an really enters their hearts. People for whom the Qur'an really enters their life. People for whom the Qur'an really changes their life. This will be something we talk about more tomorrow, inshallah. But very briefly, because I don't know if everybody here today will be there tomorrow. So one way to do this is to try to read the entire Qur'an in Arabic. Qur'an and Arabiya. Only the Arabic can be called Qur'an. Translation is not Kalamullah, that's Kalamul Insan of the translation. To read Qur'an and Arabiya, the whole Qur'an in this month. Because the Sunnah that Sayyidina Sunnah actually Taraweeh, he was reciting Qur'an to Angel Jibreel Islam in its entirety. Like annual review. Hmm? So it is Sunnah to recite the whole Qur'an in Arabic in this month. Second thing that we had mentioned very briefly was remember that because it's the month of Qur'an it's easier to connect with Qur'an, easier to read, easier to understand, easier to feel. And another thing is easier to memorize. So try this month of Ramadan to increase your memorization. Even if it's just a few ayahs, one or two small surahs. Maybe you say, okay, the rest of the time of the year I don't have time to memorize more Quran. Okay, fine. But in Ramadan, every Ramadan, try to increase your memorization level. Even if it's just an increment, but show Allah Ta'ala that you're crawling, that you're taking some baby steps. Hmm? Even that's something. It shows some movement, some direction, some talab, some desire. So you should really try to increase and you will enjoy. Maybe for some of you it's been so long since you memorized a new part of Quran, you may not remember. But when you memorize some new additional Quran, you enjoy using that in prayer. 
Now you have something new to say. You want to spend your whole life just reciting Kul Yal Kafru and Kul Al all the time in every prayer. Hmm? What if sometimes you want that I wish I could stand for one hour times? But you don't know enough Quran to do that. <laughs> right? You can't even if you want to. You wouldn't be able to do it. Hmm? So try to increase your memorization a bit more in this month. Hmm? Even if it's just few ayahs, even if you're the most beginning, even if it's just one or two ayahs, but you should try and you will find it easier in this month to memorize more Quran. And those who are more, more, spent more time already developing on their deen, then they should try to memorize a good chunk. Maybe one juice in every Ramadan, maybe half a juice, maybe one long surah, so at least sometimes when I want to, at least there should be one long surah that I know. So that if I ever want to stand a bit longer in prayer, and my jazba is shocking, the kuch ho par nikale, right, should have some ability to be able to recite more. And also, when I was talking about meaning, it's not necessary that you try to understand the entire meaning of the entire Qur'an. Although that's sometimes also, of course, what in our tradition we call doi tasir. But at least try to connect to the Qur'an at some level of reflection. Maybe pick up pick one surah, even a small surah, and really think about it. Really read its meaning, read the tafsir, learn from ulama, listen to different ulama, the tafsir of it, and just reflect and try to put it in your heart, put it in your life. Even if you implement one surah in this month of Ramadan, it's an easier month for you to try to practice Qur'an. Right? This is something you should also try. Even if it's just one ayah, for example, the ulama of the seer mentioned, there's certain ayahs of Qur'an, that even just that one single ayah, if you live your life according to that ayah, that ayah alone, its meaning and feeling will be enough to motivate you to follow the entirety. For example, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajim. If every second of your life you really felt, I'm from Allah, and I'm going back to Allah. That would change your life. <laughs> that would change your life. If all the time this was really what you felt. So we all know that ayah, right? We all know its translation also. But we don't feel it. It hasn't become part of our life feeling. So take one ayah even like that and keep thinking about it, keep reflecting it, make dua to Allah Ta'ala, beg Allah Ta'ala, Allah Ta'ala, you put this eye in my tongue. Maybe you memorize it, you put it on my mind. Allah I want you to inscribe it on my heart. I want every feeling of my heart to go through the prism of this eye. That's why Quran was revealed. To be the prism of our feelings. That's also something you should do in the month of Ramadan. So, here, a few other practical things, right? Especially now, in the last few days of Shaban, you should do something that we call Muhasaba. And you should sit down and take an annual account and audit check of your sins. Trying to see what these two angels have written. Trying to take a glimpse into your annual record of the Book of Deeds. And think what type of sins are written. Then you will think what type of sins need to be erased in this month of Ramadan. You see, first you have to see what's been written and remember that. Remind yourself. Then you will be able to target that and erase all of those things through istighfar and tawbah in this month of Ramadan. And we also mentioned dua, right? You have to make a lot of dua in this month of Ramadan. And that's also a barakah of this month. That sometimes people say, I find it hard to make dua. My heart has become hardened. But in Ramadan, automatically your heart will start to become softened. So take advantage of that, softening of the heart. And make dua and make more and more dua so that this blackened, rusted heart gets softened and inshallah gets melted in this month of Ramadan. Another feature of Ramadan is there's some collective aspects to Ramadan some ways to bond with the community. So, for example, Ijtimai Ibadah, which is Taraweeh. So you should try to pray Salat al-Taraweeh in the Masjid. So you get more sense of community, more feeling of bondedness with your fellow brothers. Right? Ijtimai Iftar, 
sometimes you should have it start just with your family. I mean, it's just you and your wife, or wife and children, or however it may be, or if you're unmarried, just you and your parents. Sometimes you should have it done in the community. You should use it for different bondings. Right? And even some of you could do it at Sahur, I suppose. Right? Or especially the family part. But if maybe, what do I mean? Sometimes in this day and age, people are so busy with the hectic lives and every even as a family sit down and have a meal together. So to have iftar together as a family, right? Have one meal together a day as a family in Ramadan. Use it to connect. Use the barakah of Ramadan to also bring barakah in the family bonds and ties between the hearts of people. Then another is to buy amal as suhba. Suhba means bayan, madalas, dars, right? Use it to join in groups and gatherings of the people who are seeking the pleasure of Allah Ta'ala. Because our deen is not a goal of our deen that you have to alone try to find the pleasure of Allah No. Allah Ta'ala wants you to do it together. Jami'ah. That's a jama'ah. As a group. As a collective. So try to increase in that as well. So these are ijtima'i. Collective aspects. And there are also infirali. Individual aspects of Ramadan. And the most important one in that is your individual one-on-one relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This month of Ramadan is the best way and best time for you to build that relationship. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has already announced in the words of the Prophet Hadith that as-sawmun li wa ana unza bihi that Allah ta'ala will give the reward for all of the different acts on the Day of Judgment. But Allah Ta'ala says, As-Sawmun Li, that the fasting is for me. as means fast. Li is for me, Allah Ta'ala. Wa ana bihi, and I myself will give the reward for it. The angel can't write down the reward for it. That's what it means. So the angel writes down, he fasted, but can't write the reward. <laughs> That's not blank. Because Allah Ta'ala says, this person fasted only for me. What does it mean? So why did explain that nobody will know whether you fasted? So you need to see it on your fast. You could so many times in the day you'll be alone. You might eat, you might drink. It's purely a matter between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you're, if nothing else, when you make wudu and you put water in your mouth, you could swallow a little bit. <laughs> no one in the world would ever know. Only Allah ta'ala would know. But mashallah, you would see that alhamdulillah, all of us when we fast, alhamdulillah, right? We don't cheat. But it's good training for us. That's how we should be in every aspect of our life. That Allah Ta'ala, even when I'm alone, even when it's secrecy, even when there's no one watching, even when there's no one who will know, even then I will never cheat and sin. I'll never do it. So Ramadan is a good training. We actually become mukhmaseen. Whereas normally we're not like that. Normally, if we get the opportunity to sin, and we think that nobody is watching us, and nobody will find out, and it will never be discovered. We sin. Most of us, the only reason we don't sin is either we don't have the opportunity to sin, or we have the opportunity, but we're scared. Maybe somebody will find out. We're scared. Maybe somebody will discover. We're scared of being embarrassed. Hmm? That's not the right reason to leave sin. The real reason to leave sin is fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when it comes to fasting, we have that level of ikhlas. <laughs> We don't sin and break the fast. And we know, nobody will ever know. <laughs> nobody will find out. Nobody is human. No creation is watching. But still we don't do it. So in the fasting, we actually reach the level of muhlisi, purely, sincerely, for the sake of Allah SWT. So since we're doing that in the fast, we should use that time to build our relationship with beg Allah Ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala, as muhlis as you have made me, in this act of fasting, make me as mukhlis in every single book of the Quran, so to say. Just like even now I am obeying you secretly, when I could have sinned against you secretly, just like that in every teaching of Deen, I always want to obey you secretly when alone. And I want to stop sinning against you when I'm secretly and alone. To build your infinitely individual relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That also is to work on your ibadah. So one thing is to increase your ibadah in this month. 
However much but it should be more than you do outside Ramadan. But I would say that especially try to increase the quality of your salah. Another thing to take advantage of is when you're fasting, so that lower, that asr, right? That you're fasting. Even the Maghrib is You will be able to focus more in your salah in Ramadan. So make it an effort. Make it a project. Make it your mission that in this month I want to improve, fix the quality of my salah, the quality of my awareness of Allah Ta'ala, remembrance of Allah Ta'ala, feelings in my salah. It's more within reach in this month of Ramadan. So it's not just about quantity of ibadah. Yes, you should increase your amount of ibadah, but try to increase the quality of your ibadah. So whether that's the amount of Qur'an, that's salah, istighfar, druz, salawat, zikr, Whatever you do, try to focus on its quality. Then Ramadan is an, an dua. One dua you should make throughout the month from day one is a kubuliya. Allah Ta'ala accept my fast. Allah Ta'ala fasted today. That's the sunnah dua. Allah Ta'ala fasted today for your sake. Allah Ta'ala accept it for me. I tend to fast tomorrow for your sake. Accept it for me. Allah Ta'ala I offer Tanawi. Accept it for me. All, everything you do, ask for kubuliya. You read Quran, after you read Quran, Allah Ta'ala accept it for me. Any act of ibadah you are able to do in this month of Ramadan, keep making dua for kubuliyah and make dua for istiqamah. I want to stay like this after Ramadan. You gave me this feeling in Quran this month, I want to keep it. I want to keep it. I want to preserve it. I want it to remain. I want to be consistent. So make dua for kubuliyah and make dua for istiqamah after every single ibadah in the month of Ramadan. And finally, last aspect of month of Ramadan, which is going to end this entire day course on, is that Ramadan is the month of Toba. It's like Ramadan was the month of Taqwa, Lalakum Tattakun. Ramadan was the month of Qur'an, Shaykh Ramadan was the Umdil Afeel of Qur'an. Ramadan is also the month of Toba. Tawbah. That we know from the hadith of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Very famous hadith. Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Ramadan, of the month of Ramadan, awwalahu rahmah. That the first ten days of this month of Ramadan are a mercy. Wa awsatuhu maghfira. And the middle ten days of this month of Ramadan are forgiveness from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. وَآخِرُهُ إِتْكُمْ مِنَ النَّارِ In the last ten days of this month, Allah Ta'ala frees people from the fire of Jahannam. What does it mean? So what it means is that there's three types of people. Again, the three levels. <laughs> different types. Three types of people who will come into Ramadan. First type is that person who actually was from the Salihin all year was obeying Allah Ta'ala, practicing deen, staying away from sin. For them, the second Ramadan starts, they get the mercies of Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala. They're drowning in the mercies of Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala. They're like that person who brings a clean glass. So when there's a clean glass, the poor pours milk inside the glass. Immediately. So they start getting the nur, anwarat, barakat, rahmat, the mercies of Ramadan. Immediately. Then, second group are those who were sometimes salihi, sometimes practicing virtuous, obedient, remembering believers, and sometimes they were sinning, sometimes they missed fajr, sometimes they misbehaved with their wife, sometimes they got angry, sometimes they felt some pride, hmm? sometimes they skipped maybe their zakat in the past year. So they were mixed mixed back. They had some good, but they also had some sin. So for them, So they enter Ramadan, and ten days they do this fast of Salihin. So they fast outwardly, but they also fast from sin. They also try to have taqwa. They leave sin 100% for ten days. By the middle of the tenth day, ten days, Allah sends forgiveness for them. He forgives them for their entire year of transgression. 
Maybe he even forgives us for the entire lifetime of sin. So they brought to Allah Ta'ala a dirty glass in Ramadan. Just spending 10 days properly, Allah Ta'ala cleaned their glass and in the middle, pouring milk. It's an example I'm giving you. Pouring milk into the glass. They get the forgiveness of Allah Ta'ala. And then, they also get the same rahmah that Allah Ta'ala gave in the first 10 days. What does that mean? So Allah Ta'ala forgives them for the prayers that they missed. And because they were so true to Allah in the first 10 days, Allah Ta'ala, out of His mercy, He decrees for them to be Muslim People who will always pray regularly. Allah Ta'ala forgives them from all of the lustful events that they did. And then out of His mercy, He bestows upon them sifat al haya. He gives them the attribute of modesty so that they don't return to that sin again. Like Allah Ta'ala said in the Quran, Allahu wa liyu ladhina amunu yukhijuhum min al-zulamati ila nur that Allah Ta'ala is the wali of those who believe truly and he takes them out from the darknesses of sin into the nur of hidayah, the nur of taqwa, the nur of imam, the nur of yaqeen, the nur of haya. It happens to them. Just ten days they spent. Allah <laughs> Ta'ala, that's the power of Ramadan. Then there was a third group. Who was that third type of person? This was that believer who was so distant from Allah Ta'ala so disobedient to Allah SWT that his name was actually written amongst the people of Jannah. Means that if that person had died before Ramadan on the Day of Judgment, they would have been sent to the fire of Jahannam for some period of time. Allah Akbar. They are on the list of the people of Jannah. But the month of Ramadan comes and this person makes true Tawbah. It's the month of Tawbah. <laughs> he makes true Tawbah and he spends 20 days sin free. He makes every prayer, he fasts, he protects his eye from sin, his ear from sin, his tongue from sin, his mind from sin. Hmm? He spends 20 days like Salihin. Even though before he had lived an entire lifetime which have made him worthy, he could not, worthy of Jannah. He spent 20 days of Salihin, Allah Ta'ala takes him out of Jannah. وَآخِرُهُ إِذْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرْكَ مِنَ Can you imagine the power of that month, that just 20 days of Ramadan can change a person's life from being a Jahannami to a Jannati. Hmm? That's 180 degree, real 180 degree change. Just 20 days of this month of Ramadan. And it comes in every single night Allah Ta'ala takes out more and more from that list of the people destined for Jannah of the last ten nights. So wa akhruhu itkum min Allah. Allah akhruhu So it means that we should not get off to a slow start in Ramadan. What most people know is the power of the last ten days. I just showed you the power of the first twenty days. <laughs> So the freeing from hellfire starts on the night of the 21st. <laughs> it means the power of spending the first 20 days properly such that you can go from Jahannami to Jannati. So don't get off to a slow start in Ramadan. That's why I say we need to prepare in Najib, prepare in Shaban, so that by the time Ramadan came, off to a running start. And spend those 20 days so well that Allah Ta'ala takes our name out also from the list of the people who are going to Jannah. Because really that is how all of us should feel. That we are in that category. We are what one of my teachers in class used to say, and I'll say it in Urdu first, Allah Ta'ala ke baghi musulman. It means that we are the runaway slaves of the true master. You know, if there's a slave who runs away, and then he comes back to his master, and when he comes back to his master first, he's scared. Hmm? But he comes back also hoping that I've heard my master is merciful. And he'll take me back. But at the same time, he's also scared that I was run away. I disobeyed. I betrayed. I was disloyal. I violated the teachings. I disobeyed the messenger the master sent to me. On the one hand, he's scared. Hmm? And on the one hand, he's hopeful. So he comes back hmm, to his master. And if he is lucky enough that his master is Allah SWT, Zumbul Kareem, Allah SWT welcomes all the runaway slaves back. 
no matter how much that person sinned, no matter how long that person sinned, no matter how brutally that person sinned, no matter how crudely that person sinned, all the person has to do is just present himself back. Just return back to his master. Sayyidina Rasulullah says in the hadith that Allah Santa loves when his runaway slave comes back to him. Even more than if there was a mother and her son ran away from her. And then imagine every night the mother is waiting for the son, wanting the son to come back. And if after some time the son comes back to the mother, the happiness of the mother that my son came back to me is still less. The happiness Allah Ta'ala has when my runaway believer, he came back to me is more. Ya ayyuhal insan, ma ghazaka bihamdika al-kareem. As Allah Ta'ala said in the Quran, it's not even just from mu'min. Ya ayyuhal insan. Oh human, oh atheist. If anybody wants to know what does Islam say about atheists and read this ayah to them. Don't condemn, we invite. Allah Ta'ala doesn't condemn, he invites. Ya ayyuhal insan, ma ghazaka bihamdika al-kareem. The whole human, what is it? Does it deceive you? I am Malik, but I am a Lumpical Kareem. <laughs> what does it mean? I am your master, but I am Kareem. I am generous. And I am a Lumpuk. I am yours. <laughs> I have never stopped being yours. You can never stop being mine. That's what Allah, Allah tells the runaway slave. You may think you stopped being mine, but I never stopped being yours. And the truth is, you never stop being mine. Yes, Muhammad says in Quran. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَفْنَدُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الْذُنُوبَ جَمِيعًا So who are these people who are addressing in Quran? It's not الَّذِينَ أَمْنُوا الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ The sinners. This is the verse in Quran about sinners. Those who sin and wrong themselves who did zulm and israf on themselves. They sinned so much. What did Allah tell them? Ya ibadi, who mere bande? Toh bhi bhi mere. Oh my slave, ibadi, my ibad. You can never stop being mine. Allah Akbar. What a kind Allah swt. What a kind and loving master. He says you can never stop being mine. And I can never stop being yours. Don't you ever despair that you cannot get the mercy of Allah Ta'ala. No. In Allah, you should know that indeed Allah Ta'ala, Yagfil Zanuba Jamiha, Allah Ta'ala forgives all sins entirely. This month of Ramadan is for us runaway slaves to present ourselves to the wave of the mercy of Allah Ta'ala. And let that wave overcome us. The month for us to make true tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Rabbi Kareem, I want you to forgive me for all of my previous sins. And in the future, I want to live my life according to your pleasure. In the future, I want to live my life according to the sunnah of your beloved messenger. And in the future, I want to spend my life trying for this tazkiyah, for taqwa, for tahara, I want to purify myself of all the impurities and I want to enter the purity of taqwa. This is our niyyah. This is our pledge. This is our intention. This is our hope for this month of Ramadan. Inshallah ta'ala, if we can live this Ramadan like that, then maybe Allah ta'ala may also include us amongst the blessed beloved, amongst the salihin, amongst muhtasin, amongst muhtakin. Maybe this year Ramadan can really be the Allahum Tattakum for us. Wa akhir al-Nahana and alhamdulillah hirabbil alamin. Thank you. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 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 Wa sallall
and that we are desperate for Ramadan. We need this Ramadan. We need all of the blessings and mercies that you shower in Ramadan. And we are coming with the hope of La Alukum Tattakoon. We are begging you, Ya Rabbi Kareem, make this Ramadan a month of Taqwa for us, a month of Toba for us, a month of Qubudiyya for us. Ya Rabbi Kareem, we want to have every aspect of this fast. We want to observe the Zahir of the fast. We want to attain and realize the bottom of the fast. Ya Rabbi Kareem, we ask that in this month, you grant us the fast of the Mu'mineen, the fast of the Salihin, the fast of the Siddiqeen and Muqallaboon. Ya Allah, Ya Rabbi Kareem, Ya Allah, we too want that throughout the year that we never want to look at anything that is displeasing to you. Ya Allah, we ask that you forgive us for all the sins that we did with our eyes. Ya Allah, protect our eyes, safeguard our eyes, restore the nur in our heart that we lost through our eyes. Ya Allah, we want to use our eyes to look at the Kaaba. We want to use our eyes to gaze upon Masjid Namwi. We want to use our eyes to gaze upon Quran. We want to use our eyes to gaze upon your beloved Oliya. Ya Allah, we want you to return our eyes to us on the Day of Judgment. And Ya Rabbi Kareem, we want to gaze upon you and gaze upon Anbiya and gaze upon Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Ya Rabbi Kareem, we ask that you make us true to this Amana, true to these eyes. And Ya Allah, we want never to utter a word that is against your wish. Ya Allah, protect us from every kind of lying, every exaggeration, every backbiting, every rumor mongering, every perjury, every falsehood, every profanity. Ya Allah, we ask that you save us from a talk that is pointless, a talk that is foolish, a talk that is futile. Ya Allah, take us away from the haram, take us away from the makruh, take us away from the fudul and the love. Ya Rabbi Kareem, make us people of hikmah, make us people of purpose, make us people of goal-oriented. Ya Rabbi Kareem, and Ya Allah, we want to use our ears in your service. Protect us from listening to haram. Save us from even hearing haram. Ya Allah, we live in an age in a society where haram is being broadcast on every frequency. Ya Allah, we ask that you protect our ears and our hearts from all of those broadcasts. Ya Allah, we ask that you broadcast your hidayah to our hearts. We ask that you broadcast the nur of taqwa to our hearts. We ask that you broadcast the nur of hayat to our hearts. And Ya Allah, green. We want to protect every single limb and organ we have from sin. We want to follow the Quran. On Sunnah and Sharia entirely and completely. Ya Allah, Ya Rabbi Kareem, and Ya Rabbi Kareem, we ask that you enable us to do amal in all the teachings of the Ulama and Mashaikh and Ramadan. Let us eat less in this month, let us pray more in this month, let us recite more in this month, let us memorize more in this month, let us feel more in this month. Ya Rabbi Kareem, let us do more Sunnah in this month, more charity in this coming month. Ya Rabbi Kareem, more Dua in this coming month. Ya Allah, we need each and every blessing you have put in Ramadan, in the beginning, we ask that you send your karam on us, your fadha on us, your rahma on us. Ya Rabbi Kareem, guide us, Ya Allah, when we go astray. Remind us when we forget. Grant us not when we are ignorant. Ya Allah, never let us become distant from you. Always keep us close and near to you. Ya Allah, Ya Rabbi Kareem, humana guna ko maaf farma. Ya Rabbi Kareem, ju guna din me kiye maaf farma. Ju raat me kiye maaf farma. Saal bar ju kiye rama farma. Ju zindi ki bar karte hai te maaf farma. Ya Rabbi Kareem, is Ramadan mubarak me hume guna se najat ta farma. گناہ سے پاکی اتھا فرما ہمیں نیکی تقویٰ پر ہے غالی والے زندگی نصیب فرما میرے بکریم ہم آپ سے آپ ہی مانتے ہیں آپ سے آپ ہی چاہتے ہیں آپ کے نسبت چاہتے ہیں میرے بکریم ہم سب کو اپنا بنا اپنا بنا میرے بکریم اپنائیت نصیب فرما کبھی غیروں کے حوالہ نہ فرما کبھی نفس کام کے حوالہ نہ فرما ہم آپ کی بننا چاہتے ہیں میرے بکریم ہمیں اپنے نفس سے چھروا دیجئے نجات اتھا فرما Ya Rabbi Kareem, we are amongst those believers who have earned the hellfire. Ya Rabbi Kareem, we ask that you grant us ishq min al-nar, najat min al-nar, salvation from the fire. Ya Rabbi Kareem, churwa dihji ya Allah, hum aapke baari bulaun hai, churwaane ke liye aai hai. 
حاضر ہونے کے لیے آئے ہیں اہل بکر کرم کا معاملہ فرما فضل کا معاملہ فرما ہمیں نیکی تقوا پر غور فرما ہمارا مرد دل کو زندہ بنا یا بکری مرد دل کو زندہ بنا دل کو ایمان سے منور بنا ہماری پوری زندگی کو ایمان کے ایمان سے منور بنا ان بکریم وی وانٹ ٹو آسک یو دیٹ وی وانٹ یو اللہ نہ ان اور کمن کا انت یا اللہ قربت یا اللہ حبت یا اللہ چلو وی آسک یو وانٹ ٹو بی کلوز ٹو یو بلوڈ ٹو یو لونگ ٹو یو لویل ٹو یو ٹرو ٹو یو یا بکریم میک اس امنگ یو عباد ان عباد کے صالحین یا اللہ یا رحم الرحمین یا بکریم وی میک دعا فار آل اور فرینڈز آل اور فیملی all of our associates, all of our colleagues, all of our neighbors, all of our brethren, all of our teachers, all of our students, Yalla, we ask that all of our communities, Yalla, we ask that you send your special hidayah on their hearts. They are better than us, Ya Allah. They are more worthy than us, Ya Allah. If they knew what we knew, they would love you better than us, Ya Allah. Guide them, Ya Allah. Help them, Ya Allah. And we make dua, Ya Bikareem, for the Muslimin, Muta'atireen of this Ummah. It will send your special rahmah on them. Send your special help on them. Show them help when there is none coming. Show them a light when there is darkness around them. It will protect them when they are surrounded. Rescue them when they have fallen. Guide them in the path of darkness. And you have a big ask that you accept us for the khidmat of deen, khidmat of this ummah, khidmat of makhluk. Ya Allah, Ya Alhamdulillah, Ya Allah, 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 wanted dua, hope for dua, who have rights over us for dua. We ask that you include all of such people in all these duas. And Ya Rabbi Kareem, we ask that you hear the heartfelt duas of the heart, the silent cries of the heart, the silent pleas and yearnings of the heart. Ya Rabbi Kareem, sab ki dili faryaat ko kubul farma, dili tamanna ko kubul farma, sab ki dil ki pukar ko labeg farma. Ya Rabbi Kareem, kya kaan kis ki saamne apne haalat biyaan karein. Ya Rabbi Kareem, aap sab کی حقیقت جانتے ہیں کوئی اپنے آپ کو آپ کے سامنے چھپا نہیں سکتا یا رب کریم ہم دلی مراد کو پورا فرما دلی فریاد کو پورا فرما اپنا دھرم سے معاملہ فرما جتنا کامل انداز سے آپ نے ہمارا گناہ کی سطح پوشی فرمائی یا رب کریم اسی کامل انداز سے ان گناہوں کو صاف فرما معاف فرما اور جو ہمارے اور آپ کے درمیان جو فاصلہ آ چکا ہے گناہ کی وجہ سے اس بوت کو ختم فرما اور اس بوت کو قرم تبدیل فرما رب ناس کا مامنا ان کا انت السنی العلیم و توب علینا ان کا انت التواب الرحیم و صلی اللہ تعالی علی حبیبی سیدنا محمد و علی آلہ و صحبہ اجمائین برحمتک یا انحب اللہ حضیم آمین